Look at Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 19 this morning. I want to read that and then we'll pray together. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence, steadfast to the end. While it is said, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Thus in the reading of God's word, let's pray together. Almighty Father in heaven, these are in a lot of ways hard words. I pray they would strike us this morning, those of us who are comfortable, those of us who are at ease, those of us who are not paying attention to our walk with you who are inattentive and unaware of what might be going on in our own hearts and how we might be drifting further from you. I ask, Lord, that you would strike us hard today with your rod, not to destroy us, but to heal us and draw us back to the right way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when you become a Christian, you enter into a particular set of dangers. By becoming a Christian, I mean you profess faith in Jesus Christ or you're baptized or whatever. However, the process is there. You enter into a particular set of dangers. You don't come into the church and dangers evaporate. Like there's no danger, there's no problems, there's no cliffs you can run off of anymore, there's no ditches you can fall in. It doesn't work that way. When you become a Christian, there are particular dangers. And probably, in our age, the greatest danger is that of presumption. It was interesting to listen to Carl Truman several, a couple years ago, and he was talking about the difference between Britain and here. Okay, Britain and here. He said, over in Britain, no one thinks they're a Christian. Everyone's unassured. No one knows whether they really believe or not. He said, when I came over here, everyone assumed they were a Christian. He said, it was a real different pastoral dynamic. When I was in England, I had to assure people and tell them, no, no, you really do, you really do love Jesus. You really are growing. I see your faith. Over here, I've got to tell people, you know what? You can't do this, this, and this and still claim to be a Christian. Oh, but I'm a Christian. Well, no, you're not. You're doing this, this, and this. You're not a Christian. Okay. Oh, but I've been baptized. Well, no, you're not. You might, you might be baptized, but you're not a Christian. Right? We live in a culture of presumption, and this is a great danger as we raise covenant children, and this is a great danger for all of us that we live in an age of presumption. It is easy for us to assume that if we have professed faith in Christ, and if we are baptized, and if we're checking our boxes, you know, I come to church, check. I read my Bible, check. I pray, Check, you know, I do those different things. Check that we are walking with the Lord. And those, of course, are all good things, but none of those are guarantees. None of those are guarantees. And what we see in our passage today is our confession is proven by our perseverance. Your confession, your profession of faith, your baptism, all of that is proven by your perseverance. It's not proven by your words. It's not proven by you being here on Sunday mornings. That is part of it, of course, and we'll get to that in a minute, actually but it's proven by your perseverance. And that's verse 14 is the key verse in the passage. And we're going to, I'm going to start with that and I'm going to end with that. But in the middle, we're going to go through some other stuff as well. Okay. So let's look at the text first. Really what you have here is verses seven through 11 is Psalm 95. Okay. Quote Psalm 95. And then he explains what Psalm 95 is talking about in verses 12 through 15. And then he gives more illustration from the wilderness generation in verses 16 through 19. So essentially the main part of the passage is 12 through 15, 7 through 11, and 16 through 19 are illustrations okay, from the wilderness generation. And let's recap what happened there with the wilderness generation. God had promised them when they came out of Egypt that he would deliver them into the promised land. He said, I'm bringing you out. Let me just give you one example of this. From Exodus 3, verse 8. Of course, this was promised all the way back in Genesis 13. To Abraham as well. Remember Abraham and Lot? In fact, Bill just talked about Lot but on Sunday evening. But Abraham and Lot, they separate. And when they separate, God says, take, tells Abraham, Abraham, go up to the top. 
and he does. And he's look around Abraham. Look north, you know, east, west, northwest, south, east. Look those four directions, and everything you see I will give to you. So this is a promise given to their father Abraham in, in Genesis 13. And then it's repeated throughout the Exodus account. If you read through Exodus, it comes up over and over again. So here is, here is the burning bush and what God says to Moses. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. So God tells Moses at the burning bush, why am I rescuing my people? Because I am going to bring them into the promised land. Okay, so they all get out. They cross the Red Sea and they come to the edge of the land. Numbers, chapters 13 and 14, two of the saddest chapters in the Old Testament. Now, I won't read it all, just kind of sum up for you. They come and they send out, Numbers 13, they send out these 12 spies to spy out the land. And all 12 spies, by the way, are mentioned by name, which is kind of interesting. All 12 of them get their name in there. Okay, and there's two. They all come back and they say, here's what they say. They came back to the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So they go into the land, they bring back all this good fruit. And they told them and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. Okay? It flows with milk and honey. Their minds should be going, this is it. This is what God told Abraham in Genesis 13. This is what God told us throughout Exodus. Nevertheless, verse 28, Numbers 13, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. And Anak was a giant, so they saw giants in the land. And you know the rest of the story. They don't want to go in. They rebel. In fact, they say this. Listen to this. Chapter 14, verse 4. So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. They want to elect, democratically elect someone to take them back to Egypt. That's what they want. And... Joshua and Caleb, the two righteous ones, plead with them. No, no, we, if the Lord will bring us into the land. No, he won't, they say. And they say they're going to stone, verse 10. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Joshua and Caleb, we're going to stone Joshua and Caleb with stones. Okay. And then God shows up, and that stops. Okay. And God says, you will not enter the land. Your whole generation will die. Okay, because you did not believe my promise. You do not believe my promise. And that's exactly what Psalm 95 is talking about. Now think about the people living at the time when Hebrews was written. They were sitting there and they had this choice between following Christ and this small band of Christians who probably were pretty ragtag and this great Jewish thing back here, the temple. And what is it, what is, what are they tempted to do? Well, let's elect a leader. Let's go back. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's go back to Judaism. Let's go back to that temple with all those priests. Let's go back to the covenants the Old Covenant and the sacrifices. Okay. So the author of Hebrews is saying, if you do that, you will be just like the wilderness generation. The generation that fell in the wilderness, you will be just like them. You will have gone back and God will destroy you in the wilderness. So this whole thing, verses 7 through 19, is basically saying, hold fast. Cling to Jesus Christ. Don't go back. Don't return don't give up. Don't abandon ship. Hold on. That's what it's saying. And that starts, actually starts at verse 6. The author of Hebrews loves to do this, by the way. He loves to take one verse and use it as kind of a transition verse. And it ties together what came before, but it leads into what comes after. And verse 6 does that. But Christ, as son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence in the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Okay, what do you mean by that? You're like, well, what do you mean hold fast? Well, let me show you what I'm telling you not to do. Don't be like these guys in Psalm 95. Don't be like Old Testament Israel, okay? Don't be like Old Testament Israel. Just one point here. Sometimes it can be difficult, but when we read the Old Testament saints, they are us, okay? It applies to us. When we read about Israel in the wilderness, rebelling against God and refusing to enter the promised land, that's, that's us. We should say, wow, that's kind of weird. What were those guys thinking way long? We should be like, oh, well, how does that, what does that say about me, Okay. And sometimes it can be hard to find the direct parallel between your life and the life of those people back there. But there is one. Something ties in. It might be Jesus. Okay, like a lot of David is about Jesus. It might be you. It might be a lot of things. But the Old Testament is there for our instruction. And what was required of the Old Testament saints is required of us. Faith. Hasn't changed. Hasn't, hasn't drifted. 
Okay? It's not like Joshua and Caleb were doing something different than we were supposed to do. Joshua and Caleb were faithful. The rest of Israel was not. So our call is the same, is to be faithful to God. All right, so try to find the connection as you read, especially the Old Testament narratives between yourself and these Old Testament saints. It'll be hard. I'll admit, and really, you could do a whole class on that. You know, how do you connect the Old Testament with the New? But try to as you read and understand um, how this connects. This is what the author is doing here. Okay, so verses 7 through uh, 11, Psalm 95, then verses 12 through 15, hold fast, basically is what he's saying there. And then verses 16 through 19, he goes into, describes the wilderness generation a little more. Okay? And what is the warning here in this passage? The warning is found there in verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. This is the warning. Beware, lest there be in you an evil heart of unbelief. And notice how these people are described throughout the passage. Okay, Evil hearts in verse 13. They rebelled in verse 16. They were sinners or sinned in verse 17. They disobeyed in verse 18. And then in verse 19, they did not believe. Okay? Not believe. So these are people whose hearts were straight, straight from God. So their hearts were far from God. And what happened to them? Well, their corpses fell in the wilderness, verse 17. God swore they would not enter his rest. And he's going to talk all about that next time when we get to chapter 4. Basically, they were judged by God because they did not believe and did not enter into the promised land. And the author is saying, Jesus is the promised land. If you don't believe in him, you will be just like that wilderness generation. You will be left on the outside looking in. And my wrath will be poured out on you, and your body will fall. You will be destroyed. Okay? And it won't be a physical destruction. It will be a spiritual destruction. Worse than what happened to those who fell in the wilderness. Worse than that. Okay. All right, so let's talk a minute about verse 12 and 13, and what it's describing here, departing from the living God, and, the, and specifically uh, the hardened, being hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Departing from the living God is a definition of apostasy. Okay, apostasy, it's interesting, that word apostasy is used in Numbers 14 by Joshua. And he says, do not rebel. Look at that. And the word there is apostatize. Do not apostatize. And apostasy means you come in, you profess faith, you've claimed, you've made a confession, chapter 3, verse 1. You've made a confession of Jesus Christ. You've been baptized. You've been brought in the church. And then you leave. You depart. Okay? You say, I don't want anything to do with God anymore. And this has happened, I've seen this happen a lot in my day. Um, a lot of people come in, a lot of people leave. And I don't know in my mind, I can think of the people who have left the faith, and I don't know of any of them who have ever come back. Now, you might have different experiences, but my experience has been that when someone comes into the church, is part of the church body for a period of time, is baptized, sits under the preaching of the word, and then they leave, they do not return. They do not come back. And we'll get that in Hebrews 6. They become hardened, and that's what he's warning about here. He's worried about that hardness of heart. And that's what happened to Israel. So that's apostasy. And really, Hebrews is about apostasy. It's about leaving the faith. And then it goes on to say, But exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. It's interesting. This word is not very common, that word deceitfulness or deceit. But it is used in Matthew 13. Which is interesting because Matthew 13 is the exact same picture. Anybody know off the top of your head what's Matthew 13? Just think, what's in Matthew 13? The parable of the sower and the seed. Okay? It's the parable of people who fall away. All right? And the exact same word is used in verse 22. Now he received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. The deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Matthew 13 is a good parallel here with Hebrews chapter 3. The picture is that sin lies to us. Sin whispers to us. Sin masquerades as light and it is darkness. Sin tastes sweet on the tongue, but is bitter when it goes down. We think of sin like a used car salesman. You know, that's how we think of it. Sin's like a used car salesman. You can see him coming 100 miles away. There he is, his hair slicked over to the side. He's got, you know, a... 
$30 suit on from Goodwill that he thinks is, you know, a $150 suit or $600 suit. And he's comes and he's talking to you and he's trying to convince you. And we think that's what sin looks like, don't we? Like we can see it coming 100 miles away. But that's not what sin looks like. That's not all what sin looks like. Sin isn't that cheap. Sin isn't that obvious. Hey? Sin is someone you like. Sin is something you enjoy. If you didn't, it wouldn't be tempting. How many of you are tempted to go talk to the used car salesman? You know, you're at a business meeting, and there's all these people, and there's the used car salesman. You make a beeline for him, right? No. You stay away. Well, that's not what sin's like. Sin's not like that at all. Sin's like, come on over here. You're like, yeah, wow, that looks pretty good. I might go over there and get that, you know? And so we have this picture in our head of sin being so obvious and so clear that we can never mistake it. If you think that way, then I can guarantee you you're sinning left and right. Sin is deceitful. It deceives you. It tricks you. It is beautiful. It makes sense. It's logical. It all works. And it's sin. There's a way that seems right to a man in there of his death. It deceives you. That's what sin does. It says, no, this is the way of life. You yeah. know? No, this is the way of life. So sin is deceitful. And you can see in this scenario, okay, for these people, the glory of the old covenant was calling them. And it was wonderful. They didn't look like a used car salesman. They had thousands of years of priests and sacrifices. They had Aaron. They had the temple. And you're meeting at some house church down the street. The glory of that. Deceitfulness of sin. So remember, now, I mean, we could do a whole sermon on this, deceitfulness of sin. Remember, sin is tricky. It is not obvious. Okay? Your heart is not going to latch on just like that. And that's why we need this word, Right? That's why we need the word. Because the word tells us, no, that is sinful. Don't do that. Well, it looks so good and nice. It looks so wonderful. Right? Well, it's wrong. Well, man, it feels so right. <laughs> you know, it feels so right. Oh, well, it's wrong. Okay? I'm sure Adam and Eve thought, well, isn't it great? That fruit looks awesome. And I'm not very smart. I love to be wiser. You know? And Adam's just standing there doing nothing, so it must be right. No, it was wrong. It was wrong. And for all of us, we've all been there. When we've looked at it and we've weighed it in the balance and we've said, no, I'm going to choose this because it feels so good or feels so right. And maybe it's lashing out in anger. You know, maybe it's lust. Maybe it's bitterness. Maybe it's laziness. Whatever it is, sin will tell you it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. You know, it is. It's a okay. So we've got this apostasy, this departing from the living God and being hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Now, what can we do to prevent this from happening? And there's three things in this passage. And then I'll start with beats. Okay, we're at first, my Baptist coming out. I didn't put Baptist in there. I could have. But Baptist, no, that's not part of the text. But anyway, a good Baptist would shoehorn in it, right? It's like shoehorn in the rapture somewhere. And just remember the rapture at the end of the sermon outline. Or just remember Baptist. No, there's three B's here. Beware your own heart. Brethren, exhort one another and believe the word of God. Beware, brethren, exhort one another and believe the word of God. Okay, so first, verse 12. My translation says beware, and that's the best way to translate it. Some of them have like take care. I think the ESV translated take care, which is fine, but it sounds like, you know, you're crossing the street. Well, just take care out there, you know, make sure you don't get into poison ivy or something. No, take care. Beware is a better term. It means look out, watch out. Beware your own heart. The first step is to understand that you are not immune to this. That is the first step. You are not immune. And this is what we all think, don't we? Well, you know, I saw that friend of mine, and boy, he really went off the rails and did some crazy stuff. But that's not me. That can't happen to me. That's not me. Okay. Notice the author here. Beware, brethren. Watch out. Take care for your own heart. You are not special. You are not stronger than everyone else. You are not unique. You can die in the wilderness just like everybody else did. That's his point. You can leave just like everybody else. And sin tricks us in so many ways, but one of the main ways it does is it whispers in our ear, it can't happen to you. Oh, yeah, it happened to him, but it won't happen to you. You're better than him. You were raised better than that guy. You're stronger than him. You do this and this and this, and therefore you're not going to fall. What's interesting, throughout the New Testament, there's con there are constant warnings to Christians, baptized, professing believers, watch out for your own heart. 
Beware of your own heart. Right? Not the other guy's heart. Your heart. Because you are not special. If someone, I've always had this sort of pastoral philosophy. If someone's worried about leaving God, then I assume they're probably okay. You know, if someone's like, oh, I'm, I'm so afraid. I want to make sure I'm doing the right path. I know how, how weak my heart is, how easily I can go astray, how easily I, I drift from the faith. You know, how, how you know, daily I'm, I'm debtor. Daily I increase my debt, you know, things like that. I know I'm a sinner. I know I can depart. And therefore I, plead, I flee to Christ and cling to him. That person, I'm not afraid of that person. If they come to me and say, Pastor Peter, I leave in the faith. I'm like, no, no, you're fine. You're clinging to Jesus. The person I'm afraid of is the person, the person I'm afraid for is the person who assumes it cannot be them. That is the person I fear for. The person who says, it'll never be me. That's the person that scares me. Because I've seen a lot of those. Oh, I'm, I'm doing just fine. I don't have any problems. Three years later, who knows where they're at. Bad places, doing bad things. Okay. Beware your own heart. That does, now, I'm not saying here that you have to spend your entire life doubting, questioning, wondering how you're doing, you know. But you do have to watch out. Pay attention to the sins that you refuse to confess. What are those sins you don't want to bring up? Those sins you don't want to deal with? Pay attention to lethargy in your prayer life, sluggishness in your spiritual life. Pay attention to ways you're compromising that you weren't a year ago. And you're letting it go. Well, you know what? I didn't used to do that. But now I kind of do it. I don't really care too much. It used to convict me. And you know, when I did that, I felt really bad and guilty. Well, now I do it, and I don't feel bad and guilty anymore. Well, that's probably a bad sign, brothers. It's probably a bad sign. If, if you're sinning more, and it's, your conscience is not being struck by that, there's a problem. So watch, beware your own heart. Look at your own heart. You are not immune. You are not special. You can fall. Okay, so the first thing, beware your own heart. Second, brethren, exhort one another. Now I kind of snuck the brethren from verse 12 down into verse 13, but that's all right. I can do that. All right, so brethren, exhort one another. But the trick is we don't know our own hearts very well, do we? I mean, we can be blind to our own faults, blind to our own sins. So what do you need? You need brothers and sisters around you to exhort you. You need brothers and sisters around you to help you stay on the path. Now, there's two types of people here, okay? And I've been, been around long enough to understand this. There are those who love to exhort and those who love to get whipped, okay? Two groups, okay? There's one group that loves to exhort, and they're always going around telling everybody, you should you make sure you're doing this, and you make sure you're doing that, and you make sure you're doing that. And then there's another group that loves to get whipped. Oh, yeah, I'm a terrible Christian. Thanks. I'm just awful, you know? And they go home, and they, they whip themselves some more, and they whip themselves some more. There needs to be balance here, okay? Some of you who like to exhort need to be exhorted more and need to listen more. And some of you who like to be exhorted need to exhort more. You're afraid to say anything because you just see yourself as a terrible Christian. Exhort one another. Okay? And you, you guys, you probably can look in the mirror and tell what category you fit into. You know? Am I an exhorter? Am I someone that goes around and likes to tell people how they should live and what they should do? Or am I someone who's like, yeah, give me, give me that punch in the face. I want that punch. Give it to me. You know? Well, there needs to be a balance there. There needs to be a balance there. Okay? We need to exhort and we need to be exhorted. We need to listen and we need to speak. Okay? And notice here what he's talking about exhorting one another to. Okay? This isn't a long list of how to live your life. The exhortation is to what? Follow Jesus. Hold fast to Jesus. Don't leave the way. It's kind of big picture stuff. Okay? He's not telling you to make sure you tie your tie this way. Okay? That's not the time of exhortation. You should, of course. This is the only way to tie your tie. Warning. Only way. I know you tie your tie differently, but this is the only way. No, he's not saying be detailed like that. He is saying, help one another stick to the path. Help one another stay on the right path. Help one another cling to Christ. That's the main exhortation. Okay? And we'll talk some about what he means by today next week, because he brings it up again in verse 7 of chapter 4. So talk that about next week. But exhort one another. And this, of course, means you need to be at worship. We need to be here. But I want to especially encourage you about the time after worship. And I got this. There's a great little book I just read called How to Walk in a Church. And this guy basically talks about all the different parts of church. How do you get ready for, why do you go to church, one? How do you get ready for church? What do you do when you're in church like this? What do you do after church? And what do you do when you go home? It's a great little book, about 60 pages. It's fantastic. But he says, it is often during the informal time after church 
that we are presented with prime opportunities to encourage and love and build up one another. So time after church isn't a waste. When you guys are hanging out in the pews and the kids are stepping on your feet and you're trying to get out of the way and you're wondering why we don't have a bigger facility or whatever the case may be, those aren't a waste. That is a prime opportunity to exhort one another, to encourage one another. So this is one of the reasons we gather for worship, not just so I can exhort you from the pulpit, but so you can exhort one another, so you can encourage one another. That's why you're here. So one of the key ways we cling to Christ is we're in a position where we exhort each other and we're exhorted. Excuse me. We, we want to hear from others and we want to help others as well. Okay. So the second thing there is brethren exhort one another. And the final thing is believe God's word. And this is down in verse 19. Notice what it says, and he's going to go into this a lot in chapter 4, the beginning of chapter 4. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And what was the nature of their unbelief? They just did not believe God's word. And let me read you. I've read a couple of these already, but let me read these to you. Exodus 3, I know their sufferings, and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 13. Today in the month of Abib you are going out, and when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service. Exodus chapter 33. I will send an angel before you, and I'll drive out the Canaanites, and the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Hevizites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. And then Numbers 13. Now this is the report coming back from the land. And I've read this already, but hear it again. And they told him, we have come to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. It flows with milk and honey. So God's word is perfectly fulfilled. There it is. And this is what you have with Jesus in the New Testament. The author of Hebrews saying, this is perfect. It's exactly what Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all those guys promised exactly. Just like God promised the land full of milk and honey. And it was. It's exactly. And the question he puts before them is, are you going to believe the word of God or not? Are you going to believe it? Okay. Or are you going to be like the wilderness generation who did not believe? They heard. It's important. They heard. They had made a confession. They said, we're going to go out of Egypt. They heard and they professed, but they did not believe. Okay. And so the final step in making sure we don't depart from the living God is belief in the word of God. And I take you back to last week's sermon on Easter. Do the great truths of God's word shape our lives? That's how you know you believe it. Not can you recite it. That's good. Not can you have you hear or heard it. That's good. All that's good. Not have you read about it. That's good. But the question is, does it shape your life? The problem with the Israelites, when they came to the land, they refused to go. They refused to go in. They refused to obey. They refused to have their life shaped by the word of God. And that's the question we're faced with every day. Is my life going to be shaped by my own heart? Is my life going to be shaped by the standards of the world? Or is my life going to be shaped by the word of God? Is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the pouring out of the spirit, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of our bodies, the communion of saints, is that what's going to shape us? Or are we going to be shaped by our own hearts in the world? And for the Israelites in the wilderness, their own hearts are what they listen to. They're too big. We can't go in with the giants. They're just too big. But we have God's word, Joshua and Caleb said. That's not enough. Okay. So what I encourage you with this morning, brothers and sisters, is believe the word of God. Especially, I mean, all of them are supposed to believe, but sometimes there's debate on some of the, the, uh, the lesser matters. But especially the big picture things, the Apostles' Creed things, the main things, let those things shape your life. So when you come to that moment, where you have a choice like the Israelites did of either going over and obeying or shrinking back, you go. You go. Because you have believed the word of God. Okay. So, beware of your own heart. Brethren, exhort one another and believe the word of God. And this brings us back to my main point. Our confession is not proven through speaking is not proven through hearing. Our confession of Christ is proven through perseverance. Now your perseverance does not save you. You're not saved because you persevere. You persevere because you're saved. 
And someone who falls away cannot say they truly have believed in Jesus Christ. Think about marriage vows. Good illustration of this. Marriage vows. Someone who's married, okay, they can say the vows, stand up here, wherever it is, they say those vows. They might endure 5, 10, 15 years. But if hard times come and they turn and they run, you would say those vows did not mean anything. At least not in the ultimate sense of the word. Or the person didn't mean them when they said them. For us, we all in here have been baptized, at least as far as most of us have been baptized. We're professing Christians. We have to persevere. That's what we're called to do. We're called to endure. We're called to come to the edge and to press on. So my encouragement to you is to be aware of your own heart, to exhort one another, and to believe the word of God. If you do that, you will find yourself entering the promised land in the last day. If you don't do that, you will find yourself falling in the wilderness and ultimately leaving the faith. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this word. We thank you that you uh, strike us. We pray that you would help us not to be um, presumptuous in our faith. Keep us from constantly doubting as well. Bring us to a place of good assurance, but not presumption. Help us to press forward, to endure. Help us not to fall in the wilderness as the Israelites did, but instead help us to uh, be faithful, to endure, to, to believe your word, and to go do what you've called upon us to do. And I pray if there's anyone here who is struggling, Lord, who has... Uh, in a sense, left, as their heart has drifted from the faith, that this word would strike them hard and that they would come back to you and trust in you and not continue to let their heart become hard. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.